Hey, this is Wes, PC Gamer. I'm at CES 2015 with Nate Mitchell of Oculus. Nate, how's it going? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. So this is the first public demo of Crescent Bay. I actually got to use it a few months ago, but for people who haven't used it, don't really know what's going on, tell me real quick just like what's changed since DK2, which is what most people have tried with Oculus. Yeah, absolutely. So basically everything has changed. Um, we have new screen technology, new ergonomics, integrated audio, back of the head tracking. Um, it's basically an entirely new setup. Um, you know, with Crescent Bay, we've really crossed the threshold in terms of delivering great comforts and great presence uh, at a level that we think is ready sort of for the consumer market. Um, Crescent Bay is not the consumer prototype, but you know, it is another feature prototype on the road to the consumer rep. And we are getting very close. And here at CES, we're demonstrating, you know, for the first time publicly, just how good it is for people. So you've got the camera back there that has to do with the positional stuff in space. One thing that I asked you about when I was at Oculus Connect, this is now the second time that I've done this demo standing up. Yeah. Is the Oculus Rift still a seated experience? It is still a seated experience. And that's for two primary reasons. The first is we do, do you want me to dive into this a little bit? That's go it. for it, go okay. for it. All right. <laughs> it is. I mean, the main reason is that we really want to nail sitting down before we have people standing up. Just because VR is so new, so different. You're taking someone, making them feel transported to this other space. We really want everyone to be seated, comfortable, and nail that before we have you get up, run around, and crash in the walls. Um, the second reason is mostly a liability concern. We are blindfolding you, putting you into the space. You know, we don't want you running around crashing in the walls. It's just, you know, people will do what they will in their house, but we really do want developers targeting a seated experience um, because you can still achieve a really high level of presence sitting down, and a lot of the de like best games, um, in a practical sense, a lot of the best games that you want to play for like multiple hours, you don't really want to be standing up. And one final thing on this is, if you look at like Connect and Wii, it's hard to find space in your apartment or house to like, you know, when I play Wii, for example, I like move all my like living room furniture into the other room. And you like, you got to be able to bowl, you need some space. Exactly, and so rather than have like this sort of more niche product that is only like, you have to carve out like a room like this, we really want it to be something, you know, almost every house you know, in the United States has a computer. So setting up right there, uh, being good to go. Like, that seems like a really good fit, and especially just to start. And we'll see where it evolves from there. Input is still a big challenge, right? Because with, with, these, with these demos that we're doing standing up, it's really just about the visual experience and the, the audio experience of what you're seeing, kind of moving around, looking at it. But for the kind of games that a lot of us PC gamers want to play, stuff like Elite, where you have you know, a cockpit or something, other than those flight games, we don't really know how we're going to control Oculus games yet. What, what are you guys thinking about? We're thinking about a lot of things. Um, input is one of the key missing components and really one of the key missing features to really go for a, a bigger consumer product. Um, we haven't announced anything quite yet. We know, you know, if you've used the Rift, you know that keyboard and mouse is a, a stretch. Gamepad is good, but it's not VR. It's kind of situational, right? Some games it just doesn't feel right to be able to move your head, but then you still have the sticks. Exactly. And you know, there's challenges and there's advantages and disadvantages to just about every idea we could talk about, right? Whether it's optically tracked hands, whether it's gloves, whether it's controllers, wands, is it some crazy game pad design specifically for VR? Um, we've been experimenting with a lot of different stuff for a long time. You know, no one outside of Oculus I don't think has cracked the code quite yet. And until someone does, you know, we have a big, big commitment to getting it right. We really do want to deliver great VR input with the Rift. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big challenge. It's something that we have a really talented team at Oculus focused on. And we'll have more news at some point. Okay, so one other thing, one last thing I want to ask you about is Razer's OSVR that they debuted at the show. They have a hacker dev kit that's a, a head mounted display, but the major focus of OSVR for them is they're trying to build this open source ecosystem for VR, for developers, for hardware manufacturers. What do you know about OSVR? What do you think about the idea of this thing that you know lots of de developers, programmers can add to to kind of change the process of developing VR games from plugins and game engines all the way up to how it interfaces with the hardware. So I don't know too much about OSVR. I watched the video last night and got a rough overview. Um, 
I can comment a little bit on the Oculus side. I mean, we're major proponents of open source. We open source the original Oculus DK1, so you can actually go build and manufacture or even start a company around DK1 if you wanted to. Uh, I don't recommend that. I think Crescent Bay is a little better. <laughs> but we did open source DK1, so for hackers and people out there, you can build your own headset using that. We also open source the vast majority of our SDK under a pretty permissible license as well. So we have people who submit uh, code fixes and changes to our SDK as well to improve it at sort of a faster rate. So in that sense, we're big into open source and we'll continue to, you'll continue to see more of that from Oculus. Um, on the open specification side, I think that is an interesting discussion to have. I mean, an open specification is where we're going to all end up in the long term. That really is at the in the best interest of developers, the hardware manufacturers, and users. Um, but it is a little premature now. And I think uh, one easy testament to that is just that we actually have two different SDKs for mobile and PC, right? So for the Rift and for Gear VR, we have two separate SDKs with different APIs that aren't totally aligned, that, yeah, exactly, aren't aligned. So why is that? Well, when you're developing hardware and software and trying to innovate and you don't know exactly where you're going, you want to move fast. And so to move as fast as humanly possible, we decided very early on to decouple them and let them both race off in their own direction because it just makes a lot more sense when you're trying to like get things done. So from, and, and also, you know, John, Carmack always used to say to me, he's like, Nate, it's like, you know, Vita and, and PlayStation, right? You don't have the same SDK for both. They're just two fundamentally different devices with different features. You want to have two separate SDKs. And it would slow us down to try to combine them together. Um, so while there are definitely benefits to an open specification in the long term, and as we get more devices out there, right, when you have the Rift and Gear VR and maybe Morpheus and whoever else releases a headset, they all start to mature over two, three years. They have mostly the same feature set. Then it will make sense. Um, and that, you know, when that time comes, you know, we'll definitely be a big supporter of that. In the meantime, an open specification kind of gives you the lowest common denominator on a bunch of headsets that don't. Yeah, it's, it does not give you the ideal experience that we want to drive developers to. And uh, we really do want developers tapping into all the features of, you know, Oculus, the Rift, and our SDK. And the only way they're going to be able to do that is to use our SDK. So we'll see where it all goes. And more power to those guys. Uh, but uh, it's a little early for an open specification. Gotcha. Thanks, Nate. Uh, can, can we have a consumer version already, please? Please? Not I'm yet. sorry. <laughs> okay. We're, we're all waiting for it. We know it's coming at some point. Thanks for talking to us. And that's it for Oculus this year at CES.